there's more to the story of an ancient artifact than what it is and where it was found. Sometimes we don't even know what it is that we're looking at. We just know that it's fascinating. The tale of the discovery of an ancient object or place is every bit as important to understanding it as the tale of the place or object. So, let's tell some of those tales now. We'll start with a very unusual and somewhat macabre discovery. In February 2022, archaeologists in Peru found nearly 200 human spines delicately threaded onto reed posts in the country's Chincha Valley area. Peru is a country of ancient wonders, and archaeologists are used to coming across the unexpected there, but this is a bizarre find even by Peruvian standards. At first, the experts at the scene thought that the spines on posts were erected by the people of the Chincha Kingdom, which existed here from the 11th century to the 15th before being amalgamated into the Inca Empire. However, the spines have been tested and proven to come from the 16th century. Inca rule was ending by then, and European colonization had begun. Rather than being mounted as a warning, though, it's possible that the spines may have been mounted as a way of remembering the dead. In the Andes, where Europeans looted the graves of the dead for their gold and silver grave goods, natives sometimes made new ritual objects from whatever was left after the Europeans went away. The same could have happened here. February 2022 also saw the end of a long study into inscribed shards of pottery in Egypt. Experts there have been examining over 18,000 fragments of inscribed pottery known as Ostraka, taken from the town of Athribis. Based on the findings of the study, it seems that the ancient Egyptians used the surfaces of their ceramics as a place to write everything from their shopping lists to their homework. Other unexpected uses of the fragments include laundry lists, private correspondence including love letters, and copies of some of the popular literary works of the era. Most of the inscriptions are written in Demotic, but there are also Greek, Hieratic, Hieroglyphic, Coptic, and Arabic examples. The pieces that have been interpreted as schoolwork include lists of months, grammar exercises, and arithmetic problems. The fragments range in age, but the oldest of them was inked some 2,600 years ago. Finding out that the ancient Egyptians still had to go to school and write shopping lists reminds us that while we might be separated by thousands of years, in a lot of ways they were like us. It turns out that February 2022 has been an incredible month for archaeologists because we have yet another great February discovery for you. It comes from Hvar in Croatia, where archaeologists have found a communal mass grave. It dates back to 2,400 years ago, a time when Havar was a Greek island settlement called Pharos. The people who were buried here were cremated, so there isn't much to find when it comes to human remains. But the stockpile of artifacts they were buried with is impressive. The team has found glass beads, buttons from clothing, coins, and fantastically well-preserved spearheads and iron swords. The fact that these people were cremated is unusual for the period, and might suggest that there was something unique about them. It isn't easy to work out how many people were buried here, but the fragments left behind by the cremation process suggests the presence of at least four men plus one woman and a child. They may all have come from the same family. The iron sword had a curved blade and is known as a kupis, which might suggest that at least one of the men was a warrior of high rank. Studies are ongoing and there might be more to report from here soon. The remarkable skills of our ancestors in the field of hydraulic engineering never fail to amaze us. Different civilizations have found different ways of controlling the flow of water in different eras all over the world. But here's a recently discovered system of waterways in Burijand, Iran. The ancient aqueduct system is part of a historical castle in Loristan province. It's a complex and sophisticated system involving the use of pottery crocs to collect and clean up the water before it was consumed by the castle's residents. The reason the aqueduct is so large 
is that there may have been up to 1,000 people inside the castle. Although castle is the correct way to describe the structure because of its gates and towers, it was more like a small town. Impurities in the water supply could have poisoned all of the residents and killed the town off, which is why so much thought went into the design and so many innovative features were included, like the use of larger pottery vessels with holes in the bottom for sieving out mud. The water still wouldn't be considered clean by modern standards, but it would have been as close as it was possible to get back then. When archaeologists discovered a set of long, hollow metal tubes in Armenia in 1897, they had no idea what they were looking at. They studied them for a long time and eventually decided that the animal head carvings on the tops of the gold and silver tubes meant that they must be scepters. We can see why they came to that conclusion. They're beautiful artifacts, and with a length of three feet each, it's hard to imagine them having any other function. However, in January 2022, scientists tested the insides of the tubes for the first time. To their immense surprise, they found traces of barley starch granules inside the tubes. That's the telltale sign that rather than being scepters, these tubes were used as drinking straws during the Bronze Age. They're called the Mycop tubes because they come from the Mycop culture. So we guess we can now say that the Mycop were enthusiastic beer drinkers. Drinking straws also appear on ancient Sumerian artwork from 5,000 years ago. But this is the first time direct physical evidence of their existence has been found. It won't surprise you to hear that these are now the oldest drinking straws in the world. The history books will tell you that the game of golf was invented in Scotland during the 15th century. But history books sometimes lie. There was a game very much like golf played in China twice as long ago as that. And to prove it, here's a 1,000-year-old Chinese golf ball. The game involved knocking pitted balls into holes using sticks and was known as Qi Wang. It was especially popular with the Chinese ruling class. There are even court paintings depicting Emperor Chuan Di of the Ming Dynasty playing Qi Huang. It was thought to be his favorite hobby. The ceramic balls used in the game were very hard wearing, which explains why more than 1,800 examples have survived to the present day. Unlike modern golf balls, Qi Huang balls didn't spend any time sailing through the air. Qi Huang was more comparable to putting than golf, with each ball traveling a few feet over a carpet rather than hundreds of feet across a field. Some ancient paintings seem to imply that there was a team version of the game that involved hitting the ball into an opposing team's goal, almost like hockey, but archaeologists are yet to find any direct evidence that such a game was ever played. Did the people of 17th and 18th century Europe punish gossips, liars, and other people deemed to have spoken offensively by making them wear comically grotesque shame masks? That's a topic that divides historians, but there's no doubt that shame masks actually exist. There are dozens of them in the medieval crime museum in Rothenburg, Germany alone. If people were truly forced to wear these masks, it would have been a very uncomfortable experience. The metal they're made of is hard and cold with sharp edges, and they're very heavy. German folk tales and legends say that people were forced to wear these masks during the 17th century, but a practice involving similar sounding devices known as scolds bridles is noted in records from the 16th century in England. The purpose of each mask was said to vary depending on the task. For example, a gossip would be punished by wearing a mask that included a mouthpiece to push down the tongue, thus making it impossible for them to speak. The question is whether the masks were made based on the stories, or whether the masks really did what they were said to do. And nobody knows the answer. Our next artifact looks like the kind of thing that you might wear if you were walking through a nuclear fallout zone. But there was no such thing as nuclear energy back when it was invented. It's the Wanha Hera, a Finnish name that translates as Old Gentleman and it's the world's oldest diving suit. It was allegedly invented during the 1720s. 
We say allegedly because the provenance of the Wanahera is a little uncertain. The first record of its existence comes from 1860, when it was donated to a museum in Rahi, Finland, upon the death of one Captain Lefstadi. The captain, assuming he ever existed, is the suit's only known owner. His suit is made mostly of cow leather, with a covering of resin where the seams meet and a coating of pork fat to ensure that the suit remains watertight. Once inside the suit, the captain would be able to breathe through a wooden tube that served as a snorkel. Obviously, that means he could only dive as deep as the snorkel would allow him. The other problem is that the suit is so bulky, he'd have struggled to move underwater at all. Still though, it would have been theoretically possible for a ship's captain to wear a suit like this and head below the waterline to survey the hull of his vessel. So perhaps it is a genuine artifact after all. When they weren't drinking, partying, and having enormous orgies, the ancient Romans were big fans of board games. Some of the games they invented were elaborate and came with rules that have sadly been lost to time. That's a real shame, because a lot of them look like they would have been fun to play. As an example, here's a dice-based game that was discovered close to the village of Freutzheim in Germany in 1985. There's an inscription on one side of the tower that celebrates a military victory over the Picts, and another on the opposite side that translates as, Use this and live with luck. It may have been a gift from a commanding officer to a soldier for exceptional performance on the battlefield. The game works by dropping dice into the top of the tower, after which the dice would fall through three levels and escape through the doorways at the bottom, making a bell ring as they did so. Presumably, this isn't the entire game. There would have been a board or a slab that came with it, but we have no idea what it might have looked like. If the ancient Sumerians or Mesopotamians wanted to dedicate a building to a particular god, they did it with a clay nail. Also known as foundation pegs, clay nails like the ones we see in these images first entered use around 5,000 years ago. The clay would be delicately inscribed with cuneiform baked hard and then pushed into the mud brick walls of temples as proof that the building was divine property. Later versions were made from metal. The funerary cones that were later used in ancient Egyptian tombs are thought to have been based on Sumerian clay nails. If we interpret the cuneiform as a type of writing, you could say that the clay nails are written records of a temple's erection and dedication, and as such, they're the oldest written documents in the world. The problem is that they're not particularly reliable documents. Aside from recording the details of to whom the temples were dedicated, clay nails also recorded who'd sponsored the work of erecting the temple. As such, they often exaggerated the worth, background, and past accomplishments of those sponsors. It seems that the aristocrats of the past enjoyed boasting as much as the aristocrats of the present. If you're lucky enough to live in a house with a garden, you might have a birdhouse in your garden to provide a little food and sanctuary to the local birds. Even if you do, we doubt it looks very much like the birdhouses that were made in Turkey during the time of the Ottoman Empire. In many cases, the elaborate birdhouses were scale models of real-life palaces. Rather than being kept in gardens, these beautiful birdhouses were affixed to the walls of concrete buildings to attract birds to the properties of the rich. Some of the more decorative birdhouses even had water troughs and mini runways to make it easier for the birds to take off and land. The Ottoman-era Turks were big animal lovers and often incorporated animal-friendly features into their homes between the 15th and 19th centuries. Very few birdhouses from that era still exist today, but you can see a particularly impressive 16th century example attached to the Buyuk Chemecha Bridge in Istanbul. The surviving examples are pretty badly weathered, but that doesn't seem to bother the birds that still use them. When the Inuit people of Alaska went hunting for otters in their kayaks during the 19th century, they often took charm amulets with them. Often, the charm amulet would resemble the creature they were hunting. Here's an example of an engraved and pigmented ivory otter amulet currently held in the collection of the Stephen McCann Collection of North American Tribal Art. 
It was carved somewhere between 1870 and 1880. The otter is depicted as laying on its back, with its paws touching its face, as if calling out to the hunter. Superstitious Inuits believed that the amulets literally helped to guide the animals to them. Every marking on its surface has a purpose. The circular marks and dots represent the animal's passage through various transformational states. Native Alaskan shamans believed that all creatures, including humans, passed through concentric circles, becoming a different animal at the end of each cycle. The skeletal markings are reminders of the life cycle, in that we are all made of bones that hold us together while we live and stay behind as evidence of our existence after we die. It's a lot of symbolism to load into something so small, but it's all here. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.